Okay, so um, I think I might go ahead and start. I want to say thank you for joining us today and good evening. My name is Brittany Lee. I am the adult services librarian at the Washington Park branch. I'm joined tonight um, by fellow librarian Lydia Nimke. Um, Lydia is our librarian over adult services with the Tippy Canoe branch. And again, I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Before me. Okay, so let me go ahead and pull up the presentation for today. So today I wanted to try to go over Black Americans in Milwaukee. And how I came up with this topic is um, I had an idea and I kind of went down a rabbit hole. I always had a curiosity how Black Americans came to Milwaukee. And when I asked that, I mean by a lot of times when we think of going north, we think of Chicago as a big city, not necessarily stopping in Milwaukee and setting down roots. And then that question became, why did Black Americans stay here in the city? And also, how are they treated? Some of the things I would like to go over during this presentation are listed here in our overview. I would like to discuss the first recording of Africans in Wisconsin and Milwaukee, pre-slavery Wisconsin, segregation, civil rights in Milwaukee, in the industrial bubble bust and aftermath, and where is Black Milwaukee now? So it is recorded that the first African Americans to enter Wisconsin were those who were fur traders, and this was about 1700s. The Wisconsin Territory at the time was an open place to come for African Americans since it was an abolitionist area, and many came to seek education, stability, and refuge. Although during this time, Wisconsin may have been a beacon due to the 1787 Northwest Ordinance that forbade the existence of slavery in the North, in the North Lake, excuse me, in the Northlands. There is record that two Black men established a trading post at what is now Marionette, Wisconsin between 1791 and 1792. And there's recordings of a Jean and Marie Jean Bonga who were enslaved by Captain Daniel Robertson who arrived in the Michigan Territory in 1782. When Robertson died, Jean and Marie married and worked in the Michigan and Wisconsin territories. In 1795, Jean Bonga died and his sons and grandsons continued their work in both Wisconsin and Michigan by working as both fur trappers and interpreters for Minnesota and Wisconsin governments with native tribes. More evidence showing Africans in Wisconsin show that there are people of African descent living in the area of Prairie du Chien. One of these members of the community was Marianne Labouche. Labouche is said to be the first female doctor in Wisconsin history. She was respected for her medical remedies, as well as treatments and work as a midwife. In 1836, territorial census recorded the existence of 17 enslaved Black people at Fort Crawford in Prairie du Chien. With no formal structures for existence of slavery over time, many of these enslaved Black people gained their freedom. In 1835, Joe Oliver, a cook for Solomon Juno, is recorded to be the first black man in Milwaukee. With the, first, with the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, this changed things. The Fugitive Slave Act gave slaveholders the right to come into free state territories and recapture black people who escaped. And here we just have a picture of Sully Watson this is also um, a recording of the first known African-Americans to be in the city of Milwaukee and more on them in a little bit. I would like to share information about Caroline and Joshua. So to the left, we have Caroline Quarles. Caroline was a 16 year old woman from St. Louis, Missouri. She left Missouri and became a fugitive. While on the run, she stopped in Alton, Illinois where she passed as white. As she was in Illinois, she was encountered by a man who saw that she was black and helped her get to the city of Milwaukee. In Milwaukee, she was later betrayed by a friend 
and this friend, his name was Robert Tipbull. He owned businesses in Milwaukee, but due to mounting debt, he turned Caroline in for $300. Here, she was able to be helped by Ashel Finch, one of Milwaukee's top attorneys at the time. He and a group of abolitionists helped Caroline escape Milwaukee and travel into Canada where she stayed safely for the remainder of her life. And to our right, we have the rescue of Joshua Glover. Joshua Glover was a young gentleman who with the help of the Underground Railroad escaped a plantation in Missouri. From Missouri, he landed in Racine, Wisconsin where he worked in a sawmill. On the 4th of March, the young Glover was playing cars with a friend and they both received an unannounced visitor. The visitor was Glover's former plantation master. The master found him and along with the marshal at the time and an armed group of men, they found Glover, dragged him out of the home and beat him and took him to jail in Milwaukee. At this time, Cathedral Square hosted the first county courthouse. So that's where he was until a group of abolitionists led by Sherman Booth came in and took him out of jail, rescuing him. They were able to get Joshua back to Racine and on a steamboat into Canada. Eventually signs that issues were arising between whites and blacks in the state in the city were in 1848 when Wisconsin officially became a state. Suffrage was only an option for white men at this time and emancipated Indian males and immigrants who were not yet naturalized. One year later, a referendum failed to extend suffrage to colored males because of a misinterpretation of complicated wording. In Milwaukee, the first known African-American family on record are the Watsons, and I'll go back to their photo. The Watsons were made of a patriarch, Sully, a whitewasher, his wife, Susanna, and their children, William and daughter, Anne Georgia. Anne Georgia eventually married a man named William and together their granddaughter eventually became the first black female lawyer in the city of Milwaukee. By the late 1920s and early 1930s, African-Americans in Milwaukee had settled in one mile area bound by West Brown, West Juno, North Third and North 12th Street. About 78.2% of Milwaukee's Black population were to be living in this area consisting of a total of 74 Blacks. But due to more racial tension, Black Milwaukeeans were faced with social and economic restraints that kept them confined to an area generally bordered by State Street, North Avenue, between 3rd to 12th Street on Walnut. This area would soon be known as Bronzeville. Bronzeville was a generic term given to an area in the city where the majority of the population was African-American or of African descent. During this time, there were those who ventured into entrepreneurship by creating businesses that helped black, the black community. Couples like Wilbur and Artie Halyard created the Columbia Savings and Loan Association in 1924. One staple that helped in the Black community was the church. Some of the major churches that were in the community were St. Mark African Methodist Episcopal Church, located on 4th and Kilbourne, and Calvary Baptist Church on 7th. I do have a few pictures. So we have at the bottom, Columbia Saving and Loan, and we also have a few of the known churches in the upper right corner. So also during this time, I'm mostly going over the issues of segregation in the city. There was the Housing Act of 1949 where Congress established the slum clearance and community development and redevelopment program. The Act commissioned federal funds to assist cities in eliminating slums and blighted areas to provide opportunities for redevelopment. Five years later with the Housing Act of 1954, 
The goal was the same, but also would help with housing and beautifying the neighborhoods. During this time, the idea of urban renewal, with this, the city had plans to do away with the slums. Unfortunately, the slums were primarily Black American Milwaukeeans. The idea was to cre create freeways going north and south in the city. So the idea was, um, also during this time, a lot of Black Milwaukeeans were already having issues with homes that were 40 to 50 years too old with poor insulation and just in poor condition. With the new urban renewal, they, um, the city wanted to go through these cities and try to knock down any land that was in the way that would prohibit the freeways being built. Oftentimes, when these freeways were being built, Black Milwaukeeans were displaced and being displaced, they weren't offered any rehousing funds. To try and help combat the prejudice and discrimination in Milwaukee, the mayor at the time, Mayor, mayor Meyer, hired the firm of Arthur Greenlee to help with the war against prejudice. The plan was to come up with recommendations that were practical and workable. The issue that it was to study was equality of education, equal rights before the law, equal opportunity to get a job and to be promoted, equal rights to rent or buy a home, equal opportunity to participate fully in the life of the community and to exercise the responsibility of citizenship. Primary problems causing tension in Milwaukee at this time also included Black Milwaukeeans expressing feelings of hopelessness when dealing the powers that be. Some members of the Black community doubted that the war against prejudice would be implemented since the local government was not acting in a manner that showed they wanted to make changes. Other issues that were presented, is, presented were employment, housing, and education, but have been a continued issue since Black Americans have come to Milwaukee. When it came to housing, white Milwaukeeans felt that Black people would cause deterioration, granted that the homes that Black Milwaukeeans were often living in at this point, which was about the 1940s, these homes are already 40 years old and in desperate need of repair. And during the 60s, the white population in Milwaukee started to disappear. And by 1980, 40% of Blacks in Milwaukee were living in poverty or near poverty conditions. And unemployment was at 25.9%. I would like to add that it might sound that I'm going from piece to piece, but for each section, it kind of is a timeline for what's happening in the city. So for segregation, we start from when Black Milwaukeeans came and we end up until current. And it's gonna kinda mirror that for the rest of the sections as well. So if anybody's getting confused, it's just going along by section. So apologies for that. And I have here William T. Green, he was a young, African-American attorney in Milwaukee during the 1800s. And he will, his picture will make sense in a few minutes. Black Milwaukeeans began their civil rights movement unintentionally in 1889, when Owen Howell filed a civil suit against the Buju Opera House proprietor, Jacob Litt. Howell filed the suit after trying to attend a show at the Buju Opera House and being denied his seat by the head usher. The issue at hand was that he was able to buy a ticket but was still denied due to being black. The judge over the case, Daniel H. Johnson, told the jury to find in Howell's favor in his reason. I do not believe that as the law stands, any such proprietor has a right to exclude price who comes decently dressed and who behaves himself with propriety. I think he has little right to exclude a colored man under the circumstances as a German or Polander or Italian, merely for the people of a particular race. That would not be a public place of resort. Another case at this time was Galepsi B. Palmer, which happened to be a black man by the name of Ezekiel Galepsi, went to go vote on election day in November 
1865. Gillespie went to vote with two affidavits, one signed by two householders in the seventh ward where he lived, and the second affidavit showed that he was indeed who he claimed to be. He did not appear on the list of voters, so the Board of Intent Registry did not accept him as a qualified voter. In March of 1866, the court reached a unanimous decision vindicating Gillespie's right to vote. Later, after the accomplishments of Howell and Gillespie, there, were, there we find an aspiring young attorney by the name of William T. Green, as you see here. Green obtained his law degree from the University of Wisconsin. At the time, he was the only Black man at the time being able to practice law in Milwaukee County. One of his significant accomplishments was the successful effort to secure passage of Chapter 223 of the Session of Laws of 1895. These were the Wisconsin Civil Rights. This law outlawed, outlawed racial discrimination in restaurants and other public places under penalty of fine and imprisonment. So I'm going to jump ahead and talk about civil rights here in Milwaukee. Um, little, I don't know how much um, everyone knows about the civil rights movement here in Milwaukee, so I'll go ahead and share a little bit. In the summer of 1963, the city had its own chapter of CORE, and the students in this committee worked to take up issues that were affecting the Black community. One of the issues was the head of the community social development commission, Fred Lenz. Lenz was known to say disparaging things and Cora felt that he shouldn't be on the board. When trying to protest this, the group was met with resistance and no outcome. Also in 1963, there was a black Milwaukee lawyer by the name of Lloyd Barbie preparing to represent the Milwaukee chapter in the, of the NAACP in the efforts of talking about school desegregation in Milwaukee. At this time, most black children in the city were assigned to a set amount of schools. For elementary, it was 4th Street, 9th Street, and Lloyd Street School. Middle schools offered were Roosevelt Junior High School, and high schools included North Division and Lincoln High School. Black children in Milwaukee also had opportunity to attend St. Benedict de Moore School that included all grades. Some alumni of this school included the actor comedian Fred Stanford, the first African American mayor of Chicago, Harold Washington, jazz musician and band leader Lionel Hampton, and Charles Holton, who was a member of the Harlem Globe Trotters. In 1967, Milwaukee saw a glimpse of riots when on July 30th to July 31st for five hours, these hours range from 9.45 p.m. until 2.45 a.m. The city had a night of unrest. The riot is said to have started with a fight outside of a black nightclub. And when police came to restore order, officers began being pummeled with objects. This was also a time where riots had been occurring in cities like Watts, California, and Detroit, Michigan. It was said it would only be a certain amount of time before the riots hit Milwaukee. It said that this riot, on top of the riots that occurred on the South Side that were less, were less known, helped the city in tarnish, helped tarnish the city's reputation. So I'm going to go backwards for a second, and I don't know if you notice these pictures here. These are some of the industrial plants and um, companies that were in Milwaukee when Milwaukee's economy was booming. And also um, on the right hand side of the photos, you might see some homes in the freeway that I mentioned earlier that was built by destroying or tearing down some of the citizens' homes. And this bulldozer on the top right is just an example of a city home that was being demolished to make room for the freeway. Once upon a time, Milwaukee was known to be an industrial juggernaut. Blacks were, that were in the city worked to be a part of that. 
the Milwaukee economy expanded off due to war contracts through World War I and World War II. In 1910, 19% of Black men were employed, and that number was 71% in 1920, and at 79.6% as the Depression approached. African Americans were the most exploited in the labor force. Most men found work in either iron and steel, slaughterhouses, tanneries, and building and construction. Black men were most often only limited to the dirty jobs, which was often feeding the furnace or performing work in rolling mills that made rails for the railroads. It was black men that came from the South with trades such as shoemaking, tailoring, and others were forced to retain, were often retained, forced to retain these skills or had to relearn what they already came from the South with and were often barred from trades such as boiler making, millwright, electricians, and blacksmiths. Racist attitudes from employers and labor unions often worked against those who are looking for work. Either black men in these fields were praised for the work they did, or they were looked at as being unsteady and incapable of reaching the requirements of factory employment. So in other words, you can they were looked at as being star employees, or they were looked at as not being able to keep up with what was required of them in the work field. So it was kind of always a tug of war when a young person of color came to the city of Milwaukee looking for work, because either they were going to find work, in, but not in what they were trained to do, or the work they did find would usually be having to muck like intestines if they were working in a packing house with meat, or like I mentioned earlier, having to feed the furnace and doing that for a long time with fumes and heat, it really was the bottom of the totem pole in work, in work duties. In the 60s, the image of black pe uh, Blacks being menial workers would be something that the community just couldn't shake. Just like the generation before them in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, when it came to being hired in the industrial field, there was always discrimination. By 1980, Milwaukee had lost 25,000 industrial jobs. Those jobs had then been replaced with service jobs. And a lot of the jobs that were here in the Milwaukee area ended up going out to suburbs like Waukesha, Wauwatosa, places that had low tax expenditures as well. So instead of paying the city taxes, they were able to go outwards. And then that way they were able to retain more jobs in those parts of the city, those parts of the county in the state. And with that, they were hiring a lot of more white workers, but weren't including black workers as often. And before I go on this topic, um, I would like to also share that I didn't have a lot of information with the 70s through 1990s, although there were things that didn't happen there. After the factories left, there wasn't a lot of job opportunities. So there wasn't a lot of growth in that way. But also in the black communities at this, in the 1920s and 30s, in Brownsville, there were a lot of self-made entrepreneurs in the little metal class that was established there. So you had doctors and attorneys living with those who did domestic work, such as maids. And it was just a nice little community of everybody of African or black descent. And that went on for about 40 years until the freeway construction kind of came in and kind of demolished the area. Sorry, okay. So now I'm gonna kind of jump forward to what we see Black Milwaukee as now. It's been a lot of jumping again, I apologize, but if there's anything I didn't cover, we'll have time to go over with questions. So 
what is Black Milwaukee now? The quote that you have here um, is just from a study that was done with the University of Wisconsin. And pretty much what this quote says is, the prison population in Wisconsin has more than tripled since 1990, fueled by increased government funding for drug enforcement rather than treatment and prison construction, three strike rules, mandatory minimum sentence laws, truth in sentencing, replacing judicial discretion in setting punishments, concentrated policing in minority communities and state incarceration for minor probation and supervision violations. From an article written in March of 2014, it looked at Milwaukee being bad for black people. Some points it shared was that black high school students were being suspended, double the national average. The achievement gap of black and white students ranked last in reading comprehension among fourth graders and public school systems have seen cuts in funding. Most public funding was found finding its way into private prisons. And at this time, black men in their thirties and forties had served jail time. A 2014 Milwaukee Journal Sentinel article reported that one in three students in Milwaukee was attending a public school that was intensely segregated. They define this as being any school with an enrollment that is at least 90% of one race. Another article from August of 2020, which wasn't too long ago, marked Milwaukee at the bottom of the largest US metropolitan areas of well-being for African Americans. The poverty rate at this time was 33.4%. In a sur this survey done with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel of 500 Milwaukee residents, it found that residents identified three major problems with the city. Those problems being public safety, race relations, and education. When asked how nice it is to live in Milwaukee, half a white and Hispanic residents said the city was quote unquote excellent or good. And while 80% of black residents said the city was fair or poor. As of 2021, the black population of Milwaukee is at 38%. And the new neighborhoods that are popping up near the old Brownsville area are Hillside, Halyard Park, Lindsay High, Grande. But I do want to make sure I highlight before the, we end that as of Friday, February 25th, the American Black Holocaust Museum will be opening, sharing the stories of Black Holocaust in America and the redemption les lessons from tragedies from the past. We are also able to explore the Wisconsin Black Historical Society Museum and their recent No Studios, which was founded by Milwaukee native and Academy Award winner John Ridley. There is also more movement in the old Brownsville area with the future of the Black Visual Arts Center that will be coming to the city in 2024. We have seen that there is celebration of Brownsville every August and outside of the area, we have the beautiful Sherman Phoenix, which acts as a food hall and boutique mall. With the many businesses that are coming to the city, we are able to explore them using the MKE Black Directory and lastly, I would like to share that the New York Times has listed Bronzeville as one of 52 places to visit this summer. And Lydia, did we have any questions? It looks like we have one, Brittany. Um, apologies for any mispronunciation, but uh, Wanza asks, did your research give information about children in Milwaukee, like the games they played from the 1920s to present? Yes, actually, I can go back and um, take a look at those. But I did find that um, I did find that they did have activities like there was the lap um, swimming pool, which is this right here at the bottom. Sorry, let me go back one. So we have the swimming pool here where kids were able to go and have fun. And they also had a notorium. What I didn't know what a notorium was until I looked it up, but it's pretty much just a fancy word for an indoor swimming pool. So we were able to go ahead and um, 
they were able to go there with a library and indoor swimming. They had parks and it was really cool to see how it sounds weird now, but kids were so had a small community. So they were able to make friends with each other and also be able to play with each other. So they just had a little community there. They would play in their neighborhoods and just play with each other. But yeah, these two were the were some of the primary places they got to hang out. And there was also a rolling skate rink. So they were able to do roller skating as well. That's cool. That's a great question. Huh. Um, so Nick also asked, what was the third issue Milwaukee residents in 2020 said was most important? Just a clarifying question. Um, and one of our participants actually responded that it was education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So public safety, race relations, and education were what um, were most important to Black Milwaukee residents in 2020. And Wanza says, thank you. You're for welcome. Responding. Any more? Oh, I see a couple more questions coming in. Um, Marilyn wants to know, how can we get a Milwaukee Black directory? And where was the article about Bronzeville being in the top 52 places to see? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop my share. And let's see. So the article I actually found with the New York Times, and let me see if I can go ahead and pull that up. In the MKE directory. I can drop a link to that in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know that it's printed. I think it's just online because it's like a living document. Yeah, so that'll definitely be something that you'll want to um, go ahead and take the link and go ahead and just save it. And while I'm working on that, did, were there any other questions? Yeah, um, Nick also is wondering if you could talk a bit more about the civil rights in Milwaukee and white involvement. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Um, cause I did gloss through a lot of it, but, um, during the civil rights movement, you did have members such as father James Gropey, who was helping a lot with housing, with housing, um, with those, what is the word I'm trying to say? Movements such as, um, protests. Yes. Housing protests for better housing for Milwaukeeans and Lloyd Barbie, who I mentioned earlier, one um, African-American attorney here in the city. He was actually supported, his white hand wo woman was actually a former Catholic nun who helped him um, with all his issues that he was doing with the NAACP and those strides that he was trying to make with race relations such as school integration. Nick says, thank you so much. And Wanda has another question. Mm -hmm. um, were Blacks involved in unions? That is a wonderful question. And I do have that information. Let me actually go and look at, look at it to give you more information. But um, Black Milwaukeeans did participate or try to participate in unions, but oftentimes um, employers already were against unions and then um, those white Milwaukeeans were often against having African Americans join unions. But I want to get that information. Yes, uh, oftentimes they did want to join unions but weren't able to. I have um, two unions that most Black Milwaukeeans were a part of was the Asphalt Workers Local 88. And there was even a Musicians Local Union as well. But um, because of the lack of acceptance, they did create their own, which was called the Colored Working Men's Liberty Club. And um, 
It consists of newly arriving Southern Black factory employees, and the club sought essential social, fraternal, and mutual benefit goals. So the idea of the club was pretty much to welcome in those who are coming from the South who are looking for work and pretty much just being a support system. Wonderful. Thank you all for your questions. I have a question, Brittany. Yeah. So what would you say is like the most interesting, like weird tidbit or fact that you learned while you were doing your research? I think that the oddest, well, I won't say the weirdest, but I think the most interesting thing that I learned was just how resilient Black Americans were in the city. Because um, like I mentioned, they started in the 1700s and they were able to establish kind of like financial stability by being able to be fur traders, also working with native tribes. But I just really enjoyed reading how even in Bronzeville in the 20s, they were entrepreneurs and they pretty much just had a city area where they were able to take in income and it was just in-house. And I kind of also really admired their, um, their determination and also their adversity. A lot of times they were getting knocked down from the twenties up until now, but just being able to be strong and push through it. I really, that was something that I really liked learning. Um, nothing really deterred the former generation. So that was really good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And it's yeah. good. It's a good lesson for us as a younger up and coming generation, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that is all we have for questions. Okay. Yeah, and like I mentioned, I know it was kind of jumbled, but I had a lot of notes and I was trying to make sure I could condense everything within an hour and also make sure everything made sense that I was trying to share. So I hope it made sense. I know it probably was jumbled, but if there's any other questions before we sign off, I'm happy to answer them. We've got, thank you for researching and presenting this information. Lots of thank yous. You did a great job. I echo that sentiment. Thank you for your help. Great info. So lots and lots of compliments and thanks in the chat. Thank you. Okay, I think there might be. Oh, one final question popped up again from Wanza. Okay. Um, did you find out info on Legacy Bank? I will not tell a lie. During my research, I did not notice anything about Legacy Bank. The only um, banking institution I saw was the Columbia Savings and Loan Association. But I would, but being the librarian that I am, I'll keep that in mind. And now I'm curious. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, seeing that there's no other questions, again, I thank you all for um, spending your Wednesday evening with us. And um, yeah, everybody have a good evening then. Before we leave though, okay, Wanda just wanted to share about the Legacy Bank. I see. And um, let's see, did she have, Wanda, did you have a question? Or did you, um, have your hand up on accident. Okay, all right. Let's see. Okay, yeah, and um, it's really exciting about the Black History, the Black Holocaust Museum. So those who attend, I hope you have a good time. And as I said, thank you again, and everybody have a good evening. Bye.